If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. We'll start the show in a moment after a word from a few amazing fundraisers about what they value most as members of Tammy Zonker's Fundraising Transformers community. I have had the honor of learning and growing from Tammy. She has really helped us understand how to communicate better with our donors, how to make sure that our mission is at the front line of their decision making. And she has just been an absolute joy to learn from. That's Stevie Shoemate from Chapters Health Foundation in Tampa, talking about how being a growth member is helping her communicate better with her donors. When you join Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community as a growth member, you get live training and coaching with Tammy twice each month. You can get your burning questions answered during her live Ask Me Anything sessions. You get to join in Tammy's live weekly hot topic discussions. You can engage with other fundraising pros like you and her private and safe online community. And you get 24-7 access to her growing library of on-demand fundraising training videos and tools. Here's Jenna Sapluski from the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families in Milwaukee talking about how being a growth member in Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community is helping her grow her capacity, her skills, and her confidence as a fundraiser. It's been so helpful for me to grow my capacity and my skills. I feel more confident uh, knowing that I have Tammy and the Fundraising Transformers group for support. I've reached out to Tammy and the group on several occasions, whether it be just some wording for an email to say, hey, can somebody give me just a little bit of feedback on this? I'd love your thoughts before I send this out for an initiative. We'll hear more later in the show about why Jenna values having access to Tammy's members-only, on-demand training library. To learn more about the Fundraising Transformers community, visit fundraisingtransformed.com forward slash growth. Today on the Intentional Fundraiser podcast, we are honored to welcome Kay Sprinkle Grace. Kay is a renowned consultant to nonprofits and NGOs all around the world through her company, Transforming Philanthropy. Based in San Francisco, she trains and facilitates retreats with boards, executive teams, and emerging leaders in the areas of fundraising and leadership across the U.S. and all around the globe. And when I say around the globe, I am not exaggerating. Amazing places like Prague, Bratislava, Warsaw, Tbilisi, Moscow, London, Paris, Stockholm, Italy, the Netherlands, Australia, and New Zealand. And I think very recently in Germany, virtually. She's also the author of Beyond Fundraising, a bestseller and one of the AFP Global recommended uh, readings for the CFRE prep. Uh, She's the author of High Impact Philanthropy, the ultimate board member's book, Fundraising Mistakes That Bedevil All Boards, The Busy Volunteer's Guide to Fundraising, The Triple A Way to Fundraising Success, Maximizing Involvement, and Maximizing Results. It's a really great read about equipping and empowering board members to serve as ambassadors, advocates, and askers. And lastly, Kay's most recent book, Transform Your Board into a Fundraising Force, where she explores what she calls PQ, so that's passion, quotient, and other 2.0 ideas on the AAA board member concept. Kay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Tammy. I am absolutely thrilled to be here and to connect with you. And because we have been colleagues for a long time, but it's been a while since we had this much time to chat with each other. That's so true. thank you for inviting me. And I'm just thrilled to be here. Oh, well, it's definitely our pleasure. Um, I have to tell you a story, Kay. I don't, I don't think I've ever told you this story. 
Um, so I was in Amsterdam a few years ago speaking on a panel with IFC, and there was a private reception where I was talking with our mutual friend, Daryl Upsall. And for those of you who may not know Daryl, he leads Daryl Upsall International, a nonprofit consulting and executive recruitment firm based in Madrid. So, hey, Daryl asked me, he said, Tammy, where are you taking your career? What do you want to accomplish? And I didn't even have to think about it. I immediately said, I want to be K Sprinkle Grace when I grow up. <laughs> And what did Daryl say? Well, that's the funny thing. He let out the biggest laugh and he had this ear to ear grin and he oh. said, don't we all? Oh. Well, I've just had the pleasure of working with Daryl um, on something called the Springboard Fund, which is um, a group of us volunteers uh, got together to help Resource Alliance uh, create uh, the funding that will enable it to have a fabulous IFC 2022, because there's been no IFC in, of course, in 2020 and 2021. And, you know, to get to get the wheels moving again and find a, the money that you need to launch it. And so it was just, I mean, Daryl is just an extraordinary person. And I love that quote. I just thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> well, and thank you and Daryl for doing that work. I mean, I feel like IFC Amsterdam is one of the truly international conferences. I, I couldn't agree more. And others call themselves international, but they're not. They, send, they tend to be country specific, the host country specific with a few visitors. Yes. And, uh, but this one is truly international. And I think it's going to be terrific. The October uh, 2022 is just going to be terrific because people are hungry to see each other. Um, we recently did a very small conference here in San Francisco, but we were just so thrilled with the attendance and people just stayed. Uh, they were just hungry to talk to each other. Yeah, indeed. So we'll definitely include a link to the IFC site in our show notes. Yes, so definitely. anyone wants yeah. to learn more and get it on their calendar, then they'll, they'll yes. know those dates. Kay, you were in the first class of fellows of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. You've received the Rousseau Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Ethical Fundraising from the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. You've been recognized with the Gold Spike Award from Stanford University for your really incredible volunteer leadership. You were named AFP Global Fundraising Professional of the Year in 2020 and um, AFP Golden Gate Lifetime Achievement Award was bestowed on you in November of 2021. Yes, it was quite a year. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I mean, truly, it's been quite a career. Uh, and as you said at the top of the show, you are not done. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. far from it. <laughs> far from done. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so tell us. Promises how to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Amen. <laughs> So tell us how you got your start in the nonprofit sector. It was through my volunteer work. And at the time that I, you know, graduated from university, I mean, my heart and soul were in journalism. That's what I majored in. I immediately went to work for a magazine first, and then I worked for a commercial television um, company. And I then later went into education. But the thread that went all the way through those years was even when I stopped out when I had my children for a while, but the thread that went through all that was my volunteer work, uh, particularly with Stanford. Um, I had been uh, volunteered for <laughs> a job that nobody seemed to want, which was class agent, which was how you write to your classmates and raise money. And I will say that Stanford at that time was building its volunteer uh, program and they invested in us. And so we were given just like top-notch training in asking and in messaging. And so when I was in public education, I was in an administrative job and then I returned to the classroom. And it was that year that the funding for teachers in California just kind of hit rock bottom. And so I was rift reduction in force and I thought, huh, I wonder what I'll do next. 
And friends of mine from Stanford said, well, have you ever thought of going into this professionally? And I thought, get paid for what I've been giving away. Now there's a concept. (laughs) And uh, a job came up that fortunately had a lot of Stanford friends of mine involved on the board. It was a, it's a children's facility, not the children's hospital, but a a social, emotional, mental health organization. But it's very near the campus and a lot of leaders that I knew. And they took a risk with me because I had no professional development experience, but they, they took a risk and it worked for them and it worked for me. And I've never looked back. And so I was in professional roles with organizations for 10 years. And I was at this children's organization. I was at a university and I was then at a statewide um, organization, a, a historic society. And, and then I went on my own. And I've, I really have never looked back since I went on my own. It was, I'm not going to say it was magic from the beginning because there was always a struggle when you set up your own business, which yes. you know. Yes. And, but once, once it got traction, it's just been the most fabulous career in life anybody could have. Mm. So during the span of that fabulous career and life, what have been some of your most significant accomplishments or proudest moments? Well, I think that interestingly enough, even with all the international work I've done lately, which certainly has overwhelmed in terms of my satisfaction and joy, I think when I look at the the more the steadier pace of how I built my business, I think for me the really pivotal point was when I was uh, I went into contract with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And I had given a talk at, um, at a PBS conference on major giving. They contacted me and I became the, the lead external consultant to CPB uh, to work with 110 public television stations, some of which were joint licensees, to implement major giving. And over the course of the three years, we increased major giving by... Oh my gosh, you know, it was like $47 million or something like that wow. came into the system. And the the long tail of that program has really been important. And and I think for me, it also gave me a, a broader view of how fundraising and boards work together because we had a soft component of the board of the project, which was to engage the board. And that's when AAA, you mentioned my book, that had been um, a kind of a, of a nascent program in my work, but they liked it so much that that's when it became AAA. And we actually implemented that in, in these um, public television stations all over the country. So in a way, that was kind of a, of a pinnacle in a, in a part of my career. And then we'll talk leadership later about the leadership program in Central and Eastern Europe, which is my, my heart piece. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, that is amazing. And I imagine on the short list of those proudest moments is, yeah. as you uh, implied, the work that you've been doing to develop nonprofit and NGO leaders in Central and Eastern Europe. And I believe that started in 2015. Well, actually, we started delivering the program then, and but the the germ of the program, it took us a while to get it planted and to get it blooming, if you will. And fortunately, um, there we have a wonderful team in place. But how it all began is actually a a very touching story. I was um, a guest uh, lecturer, if you will, at the uh, annual international fundraising festival, as they call it, that I love the Czechs. They're so excited about everything. And anyway, the international fundraising festival in Prague, and um, they use a wonderful format. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, Tammy, you're a veteran uh, presenter as well, but the first day, and it's a small conference, it's limited to hundred because of the venue. And the first day is standard conference. You know, Tammy's going to give this and Kay's going to do this and Tony's going to give this. You sign up for the class. You go, you sit in the class. The second day is what they call open space. They come together in the morning and then we say to them, so what do you want to talk about? 
today. Love that. And so they, you get a big post-it note, you write on it, and then you go post it up on the, the front of the room and then people sign up. And the ones that get the most signups end up being the ones that are facilitated. They also say which facilitator they would like. Now, I remind you, we've had no preparation. So we truly are facilitating. And the way it starts is somewhat Socratic in that when you get your group together, then you say, and what is your question? So I was asked by, and this is of course ironic and poignant, I was asked by the woman who runs the Ukrainian fundraising institute, Svetlana, I was asked if I would lead a session on leadership. So I had over 20 people. I had like, you know, a fifth of the group. And we were, you know, seated in a circle on the lawn overlooking the Charles River. And I said, and what is your question? And this young woman from Moldova, which of course is right now a very threatened country, from Moldova said, our question is, how do we lead when we have no role models and when those who tried to lead in our countries were punished? Wow. Wow. And I thought no one has ever asked me such a profound question. And this is a moment. So we had an amazing discussion. And at the end of the of the third day, we had a faculty debrief. And at that time, it was we had a faculty from Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, and and then Canada, Tony Myers was there and me. And we decided that we would do this. Then it took market testing and it took obviously promotion. We've been very indebted to Edward Marcek, who is the head of the Slovak fundraising program. And um, he basically just, you know, did the whole thing in terms of the website and all of that. So we launched, you're right, we launched, we've done six. And we were very, we, thanks to the efforts of Tony Myers and some others, we got a substantial grant from the Mott Foundation. Yeah, very good. And then they renewed it for three years, but that is up. And so this coming year, we are doing it again, but we have some other operating revenue that we'll be using. Mm -hmm. So we are going to do it, you know, I mean, if it's possible. Excellent. uh, In Modra, uh, which is in Slovakia, it's a beautiful resort. So that's, you know, that's how it all started. Amazing. And And now, you know, it's in last time, they convened in person in spite of the pandemic. And then I came in virtually three times for different sessions. And Tony and I came in once and we do like an ask, ask the expert. And uh, cause Tony, Tony has actually stepped away from teaching in the program. Wow. I mean, that's incredible and moving and inspiring. And, you know, is it the Margaret Mead quote, like never doubt? Um, that's right. What, yes. Like a small yes, group right. of people, what the you small can group accomplish. Of people, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Amazing. So let's kind of unpack Ukraine. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a heartbreaking and infuriating time. Yes. Yeah. G- good descriptions, Tammy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when <laughs> obviously Russia invaded Ukraine, I immediately thought of UK because I know of your work in Central and Eastern uh, Europe and it, it does include the countries you mentioned, like Ukraine and Poland and Czech Republic and Belarus is in that region, which, yes. <laughs> of course, is, seems very well aligned with President yes, Putin. exactly. Moldova, Slovakia, just to name a few. So these countries presumably do have a presence. These are your alumni. These are your That's students. Right. That's right. So you know them. Yes, and I have been in touch with them because, of course, my heart is breaking, um, as, as all of our hearts are breaking. So I'll just give you a few examples of how the leadership that we have encouraged. And our program is not a leadership training program. It's a leadership development program. And they're basically there with us for five days. And then we do a year of mentoring. And I was mentoring one of of the people this morning (laughs) and uh, from Czech Republic. And we get to know them. And so some of the people that I have worked with, I can just tell you what they're doing now. One person I'm mentoring now 
is she has an after school program in Slovakia, in several communities in Slovakia, through the Pontus Foundation. And they have opened for Ukraine, you know, for, for young people coming in from Ukraine. And they have set up special programs. Um, so not only are they integrating them into the schools, but there's the, the in some of the private schools, there's the capacity to have extra programs in the morning. So these children or these young people can come and be together as a Ukrainian community and then go into their classes. Um, How powerful is that? It's just, it is so remarkable. And she told me that brought it, now, you know, Slovakia is a very small country. It's only like 250,000 people. And she said that the city of Bratislava to welcome this influx of refugees in five days was able to convert a basically kind of a, of a bus terminal, a bus, maybe it's where the buses park at night or something, into a full service center for processing refugees, for feeding them, for finding them a place to live. Um, this morning, I was on the phone with a young man from Czech Republic, and he has basically two things that he does. One is he does a training program for women in technology because women have not traditionally been included in technology courses. But the other thing that he does is it's a, it's a platform for building, you know, kind of civil service and civil society. And what they have done is turn their entire efforts into being a clearinghouse so that these refugees come in and they find them a place to live. They, they do all these things for them. In Romania, a woman that I worked with, I think she was in our first or second cohort. I can't remember. It seems like I've known her always. She's an MD with an MBA. Smart She's lady. just a remarkably heartfelt yet very focused woman. She runs a program called Heart of a Child. And it started when, um, when HIV was such an epidemic in, in Eastern Europe and she would see these children on the street. And so as an MD, she thought I need to do so. So she created this program, Heart of a Child. It has since, of course, expanded, working a lot with Roma uh, children, working a lot with families that live in poverty, working with disabled children, as well as those with soci you know, social emotional needs. And they have uh, a center that is only... 40 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. And so they've had a lot of children come in and they have completely opened brand new programs. Another person who came through the program um, is with International Red Cross in Budapest. So we have, I think, the kind of the satisfaction of knowing that where we have alumni, we have thoughtful approaches to leadership and getting things done. In fact, uh, the, the man I was talking with this morning, young man that I was talking with this morning, he said that you know what has been revealed to him is how ill-prepared some of the leaders have been in these countries that are receiving refugees to kind of know what to do. And I said, how did that make you feel? And he said, well, he said, you know, it made me feel pretty good because I knew what to do. <laughs> and, uh, so we have them work on their own mission, vision, recognize their own values. And one of the interesting outcomes of the program is the number of them that end up changing jobs within like the first year because they realize there's a misalignment between their aspirations, their kind of unfurled leadership skills and the reality of where they are. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, so what we're hearing from these, these alumni is just about the, just the, the conditions. I think it is a good reminder to all of us that, you know, we had an inspiring time in our early history here in the U.S. And, you know, we don't ever forget the give me, you know, send me your tired, your poor. And we haven't been very good at that. You know, we've been very picky about who we accept. And I will say that right now, um, you know, the, these refugees are really being welcomed and with some exceptions. And we've all heard about that. But for the most part, it's just they're they're embracing them. And 
it's a tremendous, tremendous impact on their economies, on the fabric of their lives, because they're taking in refugees nearly to the equal of their own population. It really is extraordinary. And yeah. meeting not only those physical needs, you know, medical care, food, and uh, those things, but as you said, like the socio-emotional, the trauma. Yeah, I mean, the trauma. And some of them, I mean, Andres this morning was telling me about a couple of stories. And But then he just kind of in the next breath said, and I spent last weekend, he said, with my sister cleaning out a flat where um, our mother used to live before she moved and making it ready for refugees. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been really just uh, so proud of these people. Yeah. Yes. And I think what will be so satisfying is looking forward to how their leadership will ripple, right? How they will inevitably inspire, mm -hmm. mentor. I mean, what you're doing there with the Leaders of Tomorrow program, it will have generational impact. It will. And in, in there's an interesting indicator to it, which would not be immediately obvious. And it is the fact that foundations, and of course, foundations there are different than our foundations, because these are foundations that do programs and Pontus, Trog, others, they just keep sending people every year. And so that tells you that they're seeing enough of an impact that they're willing to invest year on year on year. And we've had some organizations that have sent somebody every single year of the program. Mm -hmm. And I'm and not surprised. No. And Kay, when you distinguish that it's not a leadership training program, meaning let's come together for X number of days and then good well wishes to you, but really a leadership development program that has that follow-up mentoring. Uh, I think that's a game changer. Yeah, I think it is. And we, of course, start with leadership of self. And I mean, there's some pretty deep dive stuff that we have people go in. Mean, it's, it's very well supervised and we don't put anybody in danger, but it's just like, and, and a lot of games, because we can have, as many, when we have a full complement, say 16 to 18 people, when we have a full complement, we may have as many as six or seven native languages, but the program is taught in English. We just now started the program in Germany uh, with a German speaking program, but it's the same curriculum. So there are a lot of interactive kinds of things and uh, Jana Lednova uh, from the Czech Fundraising Institute is just a master at this. And it is amazing to see how they learn and how those games, you know, transcend languages. But the learning from it is, it is big. It is really big. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and we do, you know, creative problem solving. Well, we call it design thinking now. And we have them solving problems. So we, we really give them a lot of tools, but they have lots of time for reflection as well. Mm, I love that. I love that. So, you know, we were talking about the enormous humanitarian need. So I just want to present some of the latest stats. Um, an estimated 4.3 million Ukrainians have fled for neighboring countries. An estimated 6.5 million are displaced within their own war-torn yeah. country, right? So they're hiding out in basements, and yeah. and we're hearing about uh, some very horrific things that are happening. Yes. You know, this has created the world's sixth largest refugee outflow in the past 60 years, according to uh, United Nations data that's been analyzed by the Pew Research Center. So it, it really is enormous. And you have these pockets, you know, these leaders who have come through your program. Um, but how can Central and Eastern European communities and the NGOs there specifically scale to meet this enormous humanitarian need now? It's and this is going to seem like a, a backdoor into the question. When we first began the program, we did not focus on fundraising. It was just not part of it. And we were asked 
at the end of the first year in the evaluations, they said, we really would love to learn more about fundraising. So uh, Edward Marchek and I created a fundraising uh, module that is um, taught in the class. So we have awakened them to private fundraising as well, because traditionally in Central and Eastern Europe, as in with Western Europe, you know, the money has been largely government and there are the foundations. So like the Divac Foundation in Serbia, uh, which another great colleague of mine um, is, is involved with, uh, Anna Koschels, and it was started by an American, the he's, you know, he's a Vlad Divac. He's a big base, a big basketball player with the Sacramento team. And so they started it because they came from you from Serbia and then they, you know, wanted to do well. So the fundraising, the boards are very different. So I think long-term, I think the fact that we have kind of opened their eyes to the, some of the key principles of fundraising, that fundraising isn't about money, it's about relationships, that people give to organizations whose values they share. Um, I have used a lot of the work of John Gardner in terms of roles of leaders and how that then applies to fundraising in terms of your values and, and how you operate. So I think that's one way. I think the other thing is a soft skill. And I think as I am seeing um, what some of our alumni are doing now, I think we've given them confidence and courage. And I'm a big believer that courage is one of the things that has been just in decline. Uh, and then along comes you know, the Ukrainian uh, horrible, horrible experience. And you see the courage of those people and you say, oh, yeah, that's what's possible. So and we've given them confidence. So uh, just yesterday or the day before when I was working again with one of the, the people I'm mentoring and she sent me a link to something that uh, one of our earlier alumni is doing and he has left any organization and is now becoming a community organizer. And he's organizing programs for children and he is working with refugees as well now, but he had started the program. So I think what we've done by having them tap into their own leadership potential, I think what we've done is we've sparked courage and confidence and initiative. And these, I think that one of the things that has been very evident is that in particularly in the post-Soviet countries, it's like you have to shake off kind of the last vestiges of the heavy, oppressive bureaucracy and say, I can do it. And one of the, the you know, kind of the unfortunate things about the beginning of the program was that Hunar, uh, the guy from Hungary, couldn't stay with us because Hungary is not as welcoming to the uh, to the you know the the NGO sector and to civil society as the other countries are. But for the most part, uh, I mean Poland. Oh my goodness, you know. I mean we have had so many people from Poland, and I have done workshops in Warsaw, and they are eager eager for this. So I think that where I get hope is that everybody I have talked with. And some of the people who have just, you know, signaled me through LinkedIn, they're all doing something. They may not be completely solving the problem, but they are working on solutions. And I think that if we've given them the, mm, the courage to do that, then I think we have, we have done what we want to do and what we want to keep doing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's... Very inspiring. And I think that's the kind of confidence and courage and leadership that you develop that's not episodic. It actually becomes part of your being. It's who you are moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, that's a very insightful comment, because when we first heard that people were leaving their jobs, 
we thought, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> nobody's going to send us anymore, send us their, their people anymore. But then we realized, of course, what it is, is that they are energized and they want to go where they can risk and scale and implement. And many of them have gone on their own, like this Pavel, who was um, the one that, that my, the woman I'm mentoring uh, sent me a link to what he's doing. And very exciting. Very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Indeed. We're back with growth member Jenna Zapluski from the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families in Milwaukee, talking about how having 24-7 access to Tammy Zonker's on-demand training library is helping her become a better fundraiser. Since joining the Fundraising Transformers group, I have had the opportunity to go back and rewatch a host of trainings on such a wide variety of topics from how to work with my team members inside my organization to how to get my board excited and passionate about fundraising and topics like how to reach out to a donor and how to get a meeting with a donor. Here's Stevie Shoemate from Chapters Health Foundation in Tampa, sharing that as a growth member in Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community, you're never alone. How members of the community support one another by sharing resources and lessons learned to help solve tough fundraising problems. You oftentimes learn from other people across the entire country, which is really nice because it helps you understand that you're not alone in your uh, fundraising challenges. It, um, I was just sharing with someone the other day that it really helped me feel like I wasn't the only one experiencing these challenges, knowing that someone from New York or New Hampshire or Texas, um, people all over the U.S. with varying communities and different fundraising strategies, we're all in this together. At the end of the show, we'll hear why members enjoy learning from Tammy and what you can expect when you join as a growth member in her Fundraising Transformers community. To learn more about the Fundraising Transformers community, visit fundraisingtransformed.com forward slash growth. You know, you spoke about um, leadership traits of courage, of taking initiative, of really feeling confident in your leadership. And I don't think we can, in this modern time, think about leadership without thinking about President Zelensky. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, yeah. And with, uh. with you being such a scholar on leadership, I mean, you mentioned John Gardner. I've heard you speak about Peter Drucker, Jim Collins, yeah, sure. Francis Hesselbein, who's one of my yes, longtime of mentors. Absolutely. <laughs> what can we all learn from President Zelensky's leadership? I, there's a, a, a task of leaders um, and a lot of them, I mean, most of them come from John Gardner and he certainly implements all of those, which is, you know, to, to all, to be envision goals and all of that. But there's another task of leaders that actually comes from lesser known people. Um, some people I worked with at, Santa, at the University of Santa Clara and theirs is encourage the heart. and. I love that because Zelensky to me is just like the epitome of courage. But what he's doing is he is encouraging the heart of Ukrainians and saying, this is our country and please stay and defend it. And when he said, you know, to everybody who wanted to give him a ride out, he said, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. And I think the other thing about Zelensky that is a good reminder to us is that you can have a perception of someone based on things that happened that involved him, like the whole silliness of the stuff that happened in 20, whenever it was, 2020, from the people who were leading our government at the time. And yet, when confronted with the worst crisis that anyone can imagine, anyone can imagine. He has been absolutely deliberate on point, but at the same time, he is encouraging the heart of his people who are losing family members, homes, everything, and going through the worst degradation and these assassinations that they discovered in Bucha 
And I think what we learn from his leadership is that you stay the course, but you're not a leader alone, that your leading is really measured and validated by the way you encourage others to be leaders. And every single Ukrainian who has stayed behind and learned how to shoot a gun is a leader in his or her own way, as are the mothers and children who have left the country with the understanding that they'll be back. Yes. And the intent to not only preserve their family, but to preserve the Ukrainian traditions. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. You know, I've been to Ukraine twice and was always so moved by so it's a combination of humility yeah. and such pride. Such pride. That's it. The pride of Ukrainians is just, it, it's phenomenal. And that's what is driving them. This, this national pride, this feeling that our country is, is special and we are a special, you know, a special population. So yeah, it's it's really quite um, it's quite moving, and at the same time, very heartbreaking. You know, yes, you just can't even conceive of somebody being so ruthless. Yes. Well, as you mentioned, since the invasion of Ukraine, we've seen just an incredible outpouring of generosity from the U.S. and from really people all around the world. All over, yeah, all over. So I just picked up a few highlights. Stand up for Ukraine has pledged ten billion euros for support of the Ukrainian people. Amazing. There's been more than $34 million donated in cryptocurrency. Wow. <laughs> I know. Um, so I'm not a gamer, but I do understand. I read an article that Fortnite, which is a very popular game, has raised more than $36 million and donated a, for a period of time a, the proceeds, you know, a portion of their earnings yeah. from the sale of that game, which... Great. Leverage what you have, right? For goodness. Sure. Why not? Why not? The U.S. Uh, in the U.S. donor advised fund contributions have exceeded $2.4 billion. One in four Americans have given to support Ukraine in some mm -hmm. form or sure. fashion. And I saw there was just an enormous number. I, I didn't write this down, but it was, I believe, um, over 6,000 Airbnb nights were booked in Ukraine. Oh, at least. Yes. At least. It may least. be a bigger yeah. number than that. It has been a phenomenal outpouring from Airbnb. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. So the top causes, the top, the recipients of much of that philanthropy yeah. have been around the World Central Kitchen, yeah. Um, yeah. Doctors the Without Borders, yes. yeah. uh, UNICEF Save the Children. So <laughs> there's a lot of goodness happening, a lot of support, and there's so much more needed. So... I just want your perspective on what do you anticipate will happen with charitable giving um, as this war rages on? And do you think that it can keep pace with the in, or catch up to the incredible need? I think that the, the big issue is trust. And what I've been very impressed by is the, the way in which we have been immediately assured that our money is getting there. And I think the reason that, that World Kitchen is doing so well is because Jose is so visible and he is so trusted. And after all, you know, AFP had him as a speaker in 2020 at their um, virtual um, icon. And um, I think that the reason that people have given so much is because the designated recipients have been fully vetted and I think people feel very, very confident. I have tended to give within this general arena, but I've also given to Heart of a Child, which is the program in Romania, but they've put together a 501c3 in the US for the Romanian diaspora. So I was able to give through the, you know, the US and then it, but it has already arrived in Romania. But I think that here's the nature of philanthropy and philanthropists is that the thing that characterizes our philanthropy in America most consistently is the fact that we 
love a crisis. Give us an earthquake in Haiti. Give us a, uh, a tsunami in South India. We're there. We're not so good at things that go on a long time unless they are our traditional institutions, like our place of worship or our university or our school or whatever. But these things tend to ebb and flow. What makes them continue to um, garner support is continuing to message the stories. So then the question comes back, Tammy, to the point where I think as long as the media is doing a very good mixture of the brutality with the, the happier stories, when they, you know, can talk about a child that made it all the way from Ukraine to Czech Republic by himself and found the people, you know, was helped. I think that there will continue to be the funding, but I believe that there's also a larger piece to this and some of it that I'm hearing is will the generous funding to Ukraine and to Ukrainian refugees will it impinge on funding for projects in the US? And I, right now, I don't think so, because if people are giving cryptocurrency, they've got plenty to go around. And the DAF contributions, I mean, we know during the pandemic, uh, we have a community foundation, you know, Silicon Valley, which is the largest community foundation in terms of its assets. But I mean, their, their CEO, Nicole Taylor, just sent out a note and said, look, I want all of you to give X percentage, period. And if you do, this is what we can raise and we can, you know, equip our food banks and everything else with what they need. There's plenty of money at that top level to go around where I think we might see some contest for investment is in the more modest donors, the churches that have rallied, the community organizations that have rallied, and will that then strain what they can do uh, in their own communities? They'll work it out. I have total confidence they'll work it out. And But I think that it will be up to what people understand about what's going on in Ukraine uh, to see how long this, this roar of money will continue. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's concerning. I mean, even oh, yeah. if we visualize the day when the conflict is complete and, you know, God willing, Ukraine returns to its prior peaceful democracy and begins to rebuild, the devastation is so yeah. significant. And, yeah. Somebody yesterday who was connected in that part of the world said to me, you know, this is going to be a period of reconstruction. And he said, I, I'm a student of your history, and it will be like the post-Civil War. Uh, it will be a period of reconstruction, and that will be the total focus. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I mean, we in the nonprofit, the NGO world, we truly are the brokers of hope, telling those right. stories, sharing those needs, right. sharing the successes, thanks yeah. to generous supporters and community mobilization, and so that's the work ahead. Well, and it, and it also, and you've heard me say before, is that when we slip into scarcity, our messages get very negative. When we stay in abundance, our messages are very inviting. And so far, there's been a nice balance on that. I think if the messages begin to get oppressive, that people, they kind of pull back because they don't feel like they're making a difference. And so we have to keep focusing on the abundance, which is through the stories, through the stories of survival and flourishing and rebuilding. And I mean, you know, I hope, I hope that's the story we'll be able to tell. Mm -hmm. As do I. And again, we just, you know, hope and pray and take action. And take action. Yeah. yeah. And that's, um, that's really where I think we have a good intersection with Western philanthropy and what is happening now in, in Eastern Europe is that um, these people are mobilized. They are really, and they may not be formally mobilized, but they are mobilized 
because he has encouraged the heart, not only of the Ukrainians, but also of the neighboring countries. And I mean, the fact that these these food, I mean, the feeding, everything. I mean, one of the things in Bratislava that I was told um, earlier this week was that usually the processing of immigrants, you know, takes place in a certain place, certain time. And they basically have suspended the processing of people other than Ukrainian, uh, you know, immigrants for a while because the line has gotten so long that people were waiting sometimes for 20 hours mm. to have had their papers checked. And instead they have speeded up the system. Well, wouldn't that be a blessing if that continued? <laughs> Absolutely. Any of us who have ever stood in line at immigration. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So, Kay, as we begin to wrap up today's episode, what parting advice or insights can you share about leadership in the nonprofit and NGO world? Well, I remember the late John Gardner, who was a mentor for me and a friend. And he says in the beginning of his book um, on leadership about he loves to watch leaders in action. And he said, fortunately, he said, it doesn't take much time these days. You know, because, anyway, I, I'm looking for greater leadership. I'm hoping that we're going to see leaders be inspired by Zelensky's courage and by the, uh, the people who will, will follow, you know, and kind of his lead. But I think that leadership in our sector, and that's kind of general comment on leadership, I think we are definitely in transition. It's not only a generational thing, because there is a generation of leaders that are leaving, new ones are coming in, but I see some very exciting things. We had the, the, the Rosso Forum, which named after Hank Rosso, and we have it every other year, and this, is the four, this was the fourth biennial Rosso Forum in, in San Francisco last week. And what was exciting for me was that the panel, which was invited by you know, very much younger people on our committee, and they were two individuals who are leading in new ways, uh, very much in the, the communities of building community and really ensuring diversity inclusion, equity. And I think that we, if we allow ourselves to be guided and inspired by what these young people are doing, uh, one of them, Mario Lugai, is with the Justice Fund. And I mean, he is just, he is such a thinker and he's been at the D School at Stanford, the Design School at Stanford, and he's worked with with, you know, with GuideStar and with uh, IDEO. He's just this and the other person, uh, Armando uh, Castiano, works particularly in the Latinx community. But these are amazing young people who see that philanthropy can be a true partner and a big solution to advancing a more equitable world. And I mean, our, our issue, Tammy, is that this, all this that's come to light didn't happen in the pandemic, it was revealed by the pandemic because suddenly the curtain was drawn back and we were exposed to what has been going on for far too long. So the leadership that we are trying to encourage now in the nonprofit NGO sector is leadership that is framed in a commitment to diversity, equity, access and inclusion. At the same time, being respectful, and this is what I particularly appreciated about the panel discussion that I moderated, was that being respectful of the longtime philanthropists and leaders who, you know, may not represent diverse communities, and yet they have been the ones that have advanced philanthropy as far as it has gone. And there's nothing that says that passing the torch isn't exactly the right thing to be doing. Right. But too many, <clears throat> my biggest fear is that it will become an either or. Versus an and. That's not, yeah, that's right. As yeah. a both and. I mean, it's both and. And what can a rising generation of leaders learn from those who are sunsetting? And what are the principles around deep philanthropy 
that inspire people to make seven and eight figure gifts that are absolutely for the benefit of the community and not to see it as a purchase of power, which is the, that is the, the, the gnarly area in between that there's a lot of discussion about power, access to power, preservation of power. And we have to unpack that. We have to empower our communities so that this seeming, you know, mantle of power that has been attributed to traditional philanthropy is seen for what it is. It builds food banks. It supports public media. It builds hospitals. It builds museums. How then does the rest of philanthropy make sure that those hospitals, museums, food banks, public media continue and advance and become more porous? KQED, our public media company here in San Francisco, is undergoing that shift now. We just finished a massive campaign, massive. But the biggest shift is that instead of no longer being a broadcaster, because nothing's broadcast anymore, and instead the walls have become porous, the community is coming in, they train people how to make podcasts, they have community gatherings, it's a totally different kind of an organization. So that's what I'm thinking about. Wow. So much wisdom. Thank you. Kay, I want to know, share with our, our listeners, what's next for you? What exciting projects or conference speaking engagements are, can we all look forward to? Well, we've got a couple of things coming up. You know, I mean, a, a lot of it depends on the, on the situation in Ukraine, but we are going forward, of course, with IFC. It depends on Ukraine and COVID. Uh, <laughs> we are going forward with IFC, which is mid-October. And the, um, the, the Slovak Fundraising Institute is going to go forward with its its annual conference. And then we are going to do Leaders of Tomorrow the last week in October um, in Modra, which is this absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous place uh, outside of Bratislava up in the, the, the lower mountains, if you will, of Slovakia. And uh, we, are, we are planning that. And meanwhile, I'm, you know, getting out there again. Um, you know, I've, I've now done two in-person board retreats and it was, whoa, how exciting to be actually able to walk over to somebody in the room and say, so tell me more about that instead of having to do it virtually. And uh, I have several more coming up, but I'm also, of course, trying to get some personal travel since I haven't done any in two years. So, or actually more than two years, almost two and a half. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited. Awesome. Very good. So, Kay, our listeners know that at the end of each guest conversation, <laughs> I, I like to ask a few rapid fire questions to provide a little extra value for our listeners. Sure. So, ready? Yeah, I'm All right. ready. First question What's the best fundraising or development advice you've ever received? It's not about me. Brilliant. When you go in to make an ask, it's not about you. Hank Rosso used to say, when you walk in, you know, take your, take yourself off and let the cause walk in. And then that overcomes the fear of rejection, which is what people fear the most. Love it. What book do you recommend to our audience and why? Hmm. Is this a fundraising book or another book or? You know, I, I, let's open it up. It could be fundraising. It could be leadership, your choice. I would say that, that my, I would go to a book that is, um, and it's appropriate for now, for this time, and you can still get it. And it's a book by Robert Waterman, and it's called The Renewal Factor. And what he did, he was also a student of John Gardner's, and he's retired now, but um, it basically looks at the eight aspects of renewal that John Gardner had identified and applies them to organizations. And it's something I think we should all take a look at right now because we have to go into renewal. We've heard all the re-words, renewal, reboot, you know, reset. We, Yeah. Anyway, yes, that's what I would say. Perfect. Thank you. And we will include a link in the show notes so folks can find that easily. Good. What are the top three characteristics needed to be a successful fundraiser? I think that the top one is to be a good listener to know how to ask open-ended questions, 
I believe that all of us in fundraising are dream brokers. And how can we broker the dream if we don't know what the dream is? The only way we can know it is to say to somebody, tell us about your dream. I think that you have to be flexible. I think where I've seen failure is in people who are so rigid that they couldn't see that there was another way to do it. And I think that the third one is that, you know, you really have to have a good perspective on life. Uh, You have to see that life ebbs and flows and that funding comes and goes and that the arc of a campaign or an annual fund is never going to be predictable. And so be it. Very good. What's your favorite fundraising tool or application or app? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know because I, I'm the kind that will go down a rabbit hole researching something. You know, I will, I will do this one and this one and this one and this one. I do, however, always read the Chronicle of Philanthropy online. I think it's something that as professionals, you know, people say to me, how do you, how do you know all this? And I say, I get a feed from the Chronicle every day. And Absolutely. I said, all you have to do is scroll it. I love and the so Chronicle. I would say that the app that I rely on would be the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Very good. What's your favorite fundraising conference and why? I think it's been the IFC uh, over the years. I've, I started uh, speaking there, oh gosh, more than 20 years ago. And I love the size of it. I love the location. And mostly I love the format and the people that are there. As you said at the beginning, it's truly international. Mm. All right, last question, Kay. Knowing what you know now about fundraising and leadership and the nonprofit sector, what advice would you give your younger self who's just starting out? I would give my younger self the advice that nonprofits are challenging because of the board staff balance. And I would give my younger self the advice that you have to find a way to work with both. I meet a lot of young people who go into nonprofit work and they're literally confused about what role is staff, what role is board, which says to me that there's a lot of messiness in the middle, uh, a lot of overlap, you know, not well-defined. And so I would advise my younger self to learn more about boards and how they operate and the fact that when you've seen one board, you've seen one board. <laughs> and that as you as you move through your career, each board is going to be different. I think that would help because I think that a lot of our, our angst comes from the fact that we run into issues with the board and or board committees or whatever it is. And, you know, in a way, I I always say that boards are both the best thing and the worst thing about. Uh, the nonprofit sector, because on the one hand, it's community engagement, it's consensus. And on the other hand, it is like, oh, we take so long to process a decision. And it's why a lot of people can't stay on boards, a lot of young corporate people. We may have to rethink how boards operate Mm -hmm. um, if we're going to attract young entrepreneurs and people who want to see things happen more quickly. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely agreed. Kay, as always, an inspiration, insightful, a true leader. Thank you so much for joining the podcast and having this conversation today. It's been my pleasure. And I just wanted to leave everybody with this quotation that we used as the framer for the Rosso Foundation, because to me, it is the most important message. And ironically, it's attributed to an Irish nun who served in the Crimea with Florence Nightingale. Things that are unraveling cannot be patched. We need to build the loom on which the next pattern can be woven. I think we all need to be loom builders. I think there cannot be the temptation to, quote, get back to normal, because I think we know that the normal was maybe normal for some people, but not so good for others. And so in all the work that people do, think, am I creating a sturdier loom? Or am I putting new threads back on a framework that is essentially no longer functional? Amazing. What what a powerful quote and context to really 
to end our conversation today. So if any of our listeners find themselves wanting to learn more about Kay, and who wouldn't, check out kgrace.org. I will include a link to that website, as well as Leaders of Tomorrow and your LinkedIn profile, where you write a really amazing article on the on the loom about the, on the loom. loom. Right. <laughs> yes, I love it. So that's a wrap for this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser podcast with me, Tammy Zonker. Until next time, keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. Bye for now. We're back for a final word about Tammy Zonker's training style and what you can expect when you join as a growth member in her Fundraising Transformers community. Here's growth member Jenna Sapluski from the Coalition for Children, Youth, and Families in Milwaukee. Tammy is so encouraging. She's very empowering. She really wants you to succeed in your role. And that really comes through with everything that she does, from the monthly coaching calls to the monthly webinars. The guidance I've received from Tammy and other members of the Fundraising Transformers group has always been so constructive, so beneficial, and you can tell everyone in the group wants everybody else to succeed because we all know what a challenging job it can be to fundraise for our our wonderful causes and our organizations. You may be asking yourself, can a growth membership really help me improve my fundraising results? Is it worth my time? Laurel Grow from Phoenix Family in Kansas City shared that her organization increased charitable dollars raised by 132% since joining as a growth member. Becky Shambliss from Awake in Anchorage, Alaska shared that her organization increased donor retention from 13% to 69% in about a year using what they learned from Tammy's training. And growth member Amanda Johnson from Multiplying Good in Indianapolis shared that her organization exceeded their annual fundraising goal by 104% and grew overall giving by 13% in one year by applying lessons learned from Tammy as a member of her Fundraising Transformers community. Here's member Stevie Shumate again sharing how she and you can grow your fundraising skills as a growth member of Tammy's Fundraising Transformers community. This is the first fundraising role that I have ever been in before. Um, so at 30 years old, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, well, how do I rocket launch my fundraising expertise? You learn from Tammy Zonker. That's what you do. Become a member of the Fundraising Transformers community. To join our live monthly training and Ask Me Anything sessions and get access to our growing library of on-demand training videos and tools and share lessons learned with other fundraising pros like you in our private and safe online community, Visit fundraisingtransform.com slash growth, click join, and get started today. That's it for this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. If you like this podcast, subscribe and download each episode on your favorite podcast platform. Share it on social media with the hashtag, the Intentional Fundraiser, and tag me, Tammy Zonker, and you'll be entered into a drawing for some great swag, books, and courses. And if you like today's show, you might also be interested in becoming a member of my Fundraising Transformer community, where I go live twice a month with my members with fundraising training and group coaching to help transform those fundraising issues that keep you awake at night, where I pull back the curtain on how you can take your fundraising results to the next level by teaching ways you can improve your development operations, create a results-driven, donor-centric development plan, strengthen donor relationships, improve your donor retention rates, and build a raging monthly giving program and a successful major gifts program, and how you can approach each day to ensure you'll perform at your highest level so you can be the best fundraiser and the best person you can possibly be. Thank you for showing up and for having the courage and determination to to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. Bye for now.